Let's continue our discussion of relativistic dynamics by talking about the four momentum, or the four vector version of momentum. Say I've got a particle that's moving in some random, time-like world line in four-dimensional space-time with a proper time tau. Suppose also that I'm observing that particle from an inertial laboratory reference frame R that is stationary with respect to the ground with time coordinate t and horizontal spatial coordinate x, and that according to me, the particle's displacement from the origin at a proper time tau is given by this displacement 4 vector, where each of these components is a function of tau. We know from my previous video that the 4 velocity corresponding to this displacement 4 vector of the particle is then the derivative of x with respect to proper time, and we know that this 4 velocity is given by the following expression where gamma sub v is the Lorentz factor with v squared in the square root term, where v squared the magnitude squared of the particle's 3 velocity in the reference frame r was the sum of squares of dx by dt, dy by dt, and dz by dt. Let's now take things a step further and develop the four momentum, the four vector version of momentum in special relativity. From classical physics, we know that the momentum of a particle is its mass times its velocity. So a good candidate for the four momentum, which I'll denote using a capital P, is the particle's mass and its four velocity u. More specifically, this m is the particle's rest mass. Intuitively, you can see why this might be a good candidate for the four momentum. It's consistent with the classical definition, and it also appears to fulfill what we want from a four vector. The rest mass of a particle is a Lorentz scalar, it doesn't change no matter what inertial reference frame you're in, and if we multiply the four vector u with a Lorentz scalar, we should still get a four vector in the end, and that's why this definition of momentum ends up giving you a four vector. Let's plug in our u to see what the components of the four momentum look like. Because this gamma sub v times m appears a bunch of times in the momentum four vector, some people write this whole expression as the relativistic mass given by m sub r. I'm not actually going to do that from here on in because strictly speaking, the mass is the amount of matter in an object and that shouldn't change in different inertial reference frames or with different particle velocities. That's why I'm going to leave the m as it is, leaving my mass slash rest mass as it is and refrain from using the relativistic mass. If we rewrite this four momentum vector using my three velocity v composed of dx by dt, dy by dt, and dz by dt, then this is what my four momentum turns out to be. By the way, this combination of the three spatial components in the momentum 4 vector, the gamma, m, and the 3 velocity v, this combination forms a vector called the 3 momentum, denoted by the small p. Now if we want to find the magnitude squared of this momentum 4 vector, we can just use this equation involving the Minkowski metric. When we use this equation, we get the negative squared of the time component, the first component, plus the sum of squares of the other three spatial components. Now the magnitude squared of the 3 velocity v is just v squared, which we discussed earlier in the video. If I now plug in my gamma and combine some terms, this is what I get. If we further simplify this expression by multiplying the numerator and denominator by c squared and then cancelling the denominator with the term outside the fraction, we get negative m squared c squared as the magnitude squared of our 4 momentum. This magnitude squared is a Lorentz scalar because the mass m is a Lorentz scalar and the speed of light c is a Lorentz scalar. And that's what we want from a 4 vector, we want its magnitude squared to be a Lorentz scalar. In addition, because the magnitude squared is negative, this means that by definition, the 4 momentum is a time-like 4 vector. Let's now spend some time talking about energy. When we go back to our momentum 4 vector, we can see that the three spatial components can be combined to form the momentum 3 vector, or the 3 momentum. The difference compared to classical physics is that the 3 momentum has a relativistic correction factor gamma out front. So we've got a physical explanation for the spatial components of the 4 momentum, but what about the time component, the p super t, which is given by gamma sub v times mc? I'll call this equation 1. You'll see that this p super t component is defined as the total energy e of the particle divided by the speed of light c. To see why this might be the case, let's take equation 1 and write out the gamma, the Lorentz factor. If we perform a Taylor expansion of this p super t around v equals 0, then by the Taylor expansion formula, this is what we have. You can see that at v equals 0, p super t is just mc, so this first term is actually mc, but we still need to evaluate the derivatives. The first derivative of p super t with respect to v can be found by applying the chain rule to the equation for p super t. 
When we do that and perform some simplifications, we get mv over c times 1 minus v squared over c squared to the power 3 over 2. Let's now take the second derivative of p super t. This time we'll have to apply a combination of the chain rule and the quotient rule. So we take the derivative of the numerator, which is just m, times our denominator, minus the derivative of the denominator, which is this monstrosity, times the numerator, and then we divide all of that by the square of the denominator. When evaluated at v equals 0, the first derivative is just 0, while the second derivative at v equals 0 is just m over c. When we plug this into our Taylor expansion for p super t, this is what we end up with. Now this second term should look pretty familiar. The half mv squared piece is just the non-relativistic kinetic energy of my particle. So overall, the second term is just the non-relativistic kinetic energy divided by the speed of light. The rest of the terms that I haven't shown with the higher powers of v are just the more relativistic terms in the overall kinetic energy divided by c, of course. And so now it should make sense why the p super t component is the ratio of the total energy e to the speed of light c. You actually see components of the total energy divided by c in the Taylor expanded expression for this p super t, and this includes the non-relativistic kinetic energy, the half mv squared we're all familiar with. So now if we bring back equation 1 and write p super t as e over c instead, this is what we end up with. If we now isolate the total energy and write down our full expression for gamma, we end up with this equation for the total energy of a relativistic particle with speed v. I'm going to call this equation 2. There's two important limits we now need to look at. The first is that as the speed of my particle approaches the speed of light, the energy of the particle starts getting larger and larger. In fact, as v approaches c, e approaches infinity. What this means is that in order to take a particle from a below light speed and accelerate that particle to light speed, you need an infinite amount of energy. You need to do an infinite amount of work to impart the energy needed for a mass-containing particle to reach the speed of light. This is the big reason that it's virtually impossible to have a mass-containing particle even reach the speed of light, because getting there requires infinite energy. The other important limit is the limit as v approaches zero. When the particle speed becomes zero, when the particle is at rest relative to my observer's inertial reference frame, then my particle still has energy. This energy that the particle has when it's at rest is called the rest energy and is equal to mc squared. And this is where E equals mc squared comes from. This famous Einstein equation describes the energy of a particle with mass m that is at rest and has zero kinetic energy. The other important implication is that in some chemical processes, which include nuclear processes like fission, fusion, and even chemical reactions, the mass of our atoms and molecules involved can actually change very slightly as those reactions release or absorb energy. If the reaction releases energy, the mass of our end product will be slightly lower because the delta in the mass is converted to energy via mc squared. Conversely, if the reaction absorbs energy, the mass of our end product will be slightly higher as the gain in the mass corresponded to the energy absorbed. So instead of of pure energy or mass conservation, it's more accurate to think of it as the conservation of mass and energy combined. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.